my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Mike Mickelson, um, who is a Nortel Networks Assistant Professor of Electrical Engineering and also an Assistant Professor in Physics at Duke University. Her research interests span ultrafast phenomenon in artificially structured materials, nanophotonics, plasmonics, light matter interactions in quantum confined structures, spin phenomenon in the solid state, and quantum information science. Um, she received her BS in physics from the University of Copenhagen, Denmark in 2004, and her PhD in physics from the University of California, Santa Barbara in 2009. And before joining Duke, she worked as a postdoctoral fellow with Professor Xiang Zhang at the University of California um, at Berkeley. Her, she has numerous awards. Um, despite her, her short time as an assistant professor, she's received the NSF Career Award, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research Young Investigator Award, uh, the Ralph E. Powell Junior Faculty Award, and the European Physical Studies PhD Thesis Prize in Quantum Electronics and Optics. So let us uh, welcome Mike and Mickelson. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the introduction and, and thanks for the invitation to visit here. It's a really a pleasure to, to be here. It's a wonderful city, wonderful campus. I'm very excited. So today I will tell you about um, some of the recent work from my group at Duke, in particular how we can tailor uh, radiative processes of quantum dots and 2D materials using uh, plasmonic structures that look something like the cartoon here. Before I get into that, I just want to give you a little bit of overview of the different research areas in my group. So, of course, we work on plasmonics, where we utilize um, collective oscillations of free electrons to um, enhance light matter interactions at the nanoscale. I also work in spintronics, where we can use control of electron spins in solid state systems uh, to uh, potentially use that as a qubit in future quantum information systems. And finally, I have some work in 2D semiconductor materials that has interesting optical selection rules that allows for uh, spin control as well and integration. So I will have some combination of the 2D materials and plasmonics in this talk. And the main focus will be on how we can utilize these plasmonic structures. So the reason I got interested in that is that I'm really um, interested in how we can tailor light matter interactions and how we can modify properties of materials by sculpting the electromagnetic environment around them. And there's a few different ways that we can do that. We can put our emitters, such as semiconductor materials, uh, fluorescing dye molecules, in an optical cavity, such as a photonic crystal cavity that's shown here. This allows stronger interaction between uh, light and matter and allows you to tailor the spontaneous emission rate, for example. Another approach is to uh, use very small mode volume cav cavities, and we can create that using the plasmonic structures. Uh, so I will explain that a little bit uh, more detail later as well. But basically what we can do is take the optical field that's coming in and concentrate it to very small mode volumes so we can get very intense fields uh, in between two metal interfaces, as you see here. So that also allows a pathway to modify properties of our semiconductors. So uh, sculpting the environment in this way allows control of the absorption and the spontaneous emission rate. It also allows control of the ratio between various decay channels as well as the radiation pattern of your materials. And uh, it actually allows you to get these material properties that are far removed from the bulk counterpart. So we can get properties that we cannot find in naturally occurring materials. And we can see when we have can modify these very fundamental semiconductor uh, properties in a sense that can is laying the groundwork for, for most of our uh, modern technologies, if you can really start to create nanomaterials that has undermined tailored properties that you can't find naturally, you can have an impact on a lot of different uh, future technologies, such as, for example, ultra-fast switching LEDs that could be enabled by this ultra-fast spontaneous emission rate that I will show you in this talk. Um, using such sculpted electromagnetic environment also allows much more efficient absorption, which could uh, create um, uh, very efficient photodetectors and impact light harvesting. And the very concentrated fields could uh, also uh, enhance and tailor nonlinear phenomena. And I will also show you that we can actually take this to a single quantum emitter level, and in that way it may have a pathway to also impact uh, future quantum information schemes. So I hope you convince you here that there's a lot of potential impact, but of course there's also a lot of challenges to uh, reach such a vision. Using high quality factor cavities, such as a photonic crystal cavity that's shown here, 
actually has shown pretty modest enhancements in the spontaneous emission rate. So people have worked on this in the fields for a decade or more very intensely, and the highest enhancements that has been shown to date is around a factor of 30 in these structures. It also requires uh, intensive nanofabrication, as you might can see from this atomic force microscope uh, image. Um, and since it's a high quality factor cavity, that means that it has a very narrow line width um, that it's working within, which is a disadvantage if you're looking at broad temperature emitters, um, and also if you want to scale it up. So you want to um, match an emitter wavelength to this narrow cavity, you would have to have fine tuning of each of these devices individually, which would be very challenging. Uh, so um, using uh, plasmonics that has much broader line width, um, would address that, but then it would have some other challenges. One of those is that we really only can get these last field enhancements that I said was so promising here if we have gaps between metal interfaces that's only about 10 nanometer. So of course that's challenging to create as well, and also challenging to do that in a scalable fashion. Um, and then one more thing is that when we introduce metals into our semiconductor materials, we're also introducing additional loss channels. So we will also have to mediate that. So in this talk, I will show you how we can actually address the first two challenges by borrowing well-known techniques from chemistry and self-assembly and colloidal synthesis that allows us actually to get not just a 10 nanometer resolution, but a single nanometer resolution, and allows us to do that over wafer scale areas or beyond that and conformal surfaces. So that can address some of the scalability um, concerns as well. And I will show how we can use very well optimized designs that actually minimize the losses and actually enhancing what's called the radio to quantum efficiency, which is how efficiently our emitters emit light out to free space as opposed to uh, excitations in the middle or lattice vibrations. Uh, so we can actually uh, improve that over our free space. So it's, it's pretty efficient. So that leads me to an outline of my talk. So uh, after this little bit of introduction, I will show you how we can um, control absorption and spontaneous emission rates very efficiently. We can do this both of a variety of dye molecules, semiconductor quantum dots, and actually also single quantum dots. And then I will show you how we can utilize uh, higher order modes uh, of these cavity structures, as well as nonlinear processes. Uh, then I will show you how, because we're using all these chemistry techniques, it actually allows us to uh, get large scale performance as well, for example, uh, to make uh, what's called perfect absorbers. And then finally, I will show you a different geometry where we uh, can create wavelength tunable uh, plasma and lasers. Uh, the main focus of my talk will be uh, the first area here, and that's what I will start with as well, after just giving you a little more introduction to plasmonics. So what we are utilizing here is um, basically coherent uh, electron oscillations at a metal dielectric interface, such as the uh, gold and air interfaces shown here. We can also have localized surface plasmons uh, in small metal nanoparticles, such as the spheres shown here. And these, also, uh, these free electrons also oscillate at a particular frequency that we would refer to as the plasmon resonance, and that depends upon the size and the shape and the material of our nanoparticles, which are all much smaller than the wavelengths of light. And the thing about this uh, uh, plasmon wavelength is that it's uh, very small, and when we have light coming in, that allows us to excite these structures and then get large field enhancements in small regions, which get us to these enhanced optical effects that I mentioned a few slides back, such as enhanced absorption, spontaneous emission, and nonlinear generation. And of course, there's been a lot of work in the field on how we can utilize such structures to modify uh, light matter interactions, so I'll just show a couple of um, previous results here. So the first is how can we uh, modify the fluorescence of single molecules? So this is uh, uh, C enhancement about 1300, which is from Murnau's group at Stanford. Here they use this um, what's called a bow tie antenna. So it's two triangular silver um, uh, shapes here, and then there's an air gap in between. And we can see there's a high field enhancement in this region, and then place a uh, few or single molecules in this region, and they can see large enhancements uh, in the fluorescence that's emitted. 
There's also been done work on how to enhance the spontaneous emission rate using plasmonic structures. And one shown here that we were inspired by in, in designing our own structure is a silver nanowire on top of a, a silver film here, and then a small gap in between. But here the light uh, is emitted and um, I think it's uh, in plane and also not as high quantum efficiency. So what we were looking for is to be able to achieve large spontaneous emission rate enhancements, a high quantum efficiency, which is how efficiently when we excite, um, one, when one photon is absorbed, how efficient is that actually emitting to free space as opposed to going into other decay channels that's not radiative, and also get directional emission and all in one structure. Uh, so one structure that's very promising to achieve that is uh, shown here. So it's a little uh, silver nanocube that's 75 nanometers across. It's placed on top of a metal film and there's a small gap in between the two that's uh, created with a dielectric spacer and we could then embed emitters in that dielectric spacer layer as well. And this is an optical analog of a grounded pads antenna. It has a very small effective mode volume and a resulting very high electric field enhancements up to about 100 fold and also a relatively large area. And um, it has a several advantages, this structure. Oh, <laughs> actually, when we create these structures, so this is the SEM, it actually looks very similar to the cartoon I made here. So they are indeed uh, small, small nanocubes. Um, so it has several advantages. One is that um, it supports a cavity mode here. Uh, so sort of uh, gap plasmons and a fibro cavity that's propagating um, in between these two um, uh, uh, interfaces and depends on the length of the cube. So by just changing the size of the cube, uh, we can change the cavity resonance. But we can also change the cavity resonance by changing the gap size and in that way we're also changing the local field enhancement. So we have multiple knobs so to modify the um, plasmon resonance independent of the local field enhancement. So it's a very well controlled structure and this is really what's shown to be key when we explore this for us. We need control that's beyond what you traditionally get. We need the single nanometer control. We need to exactly overlap all the different resonances very well. And this allows us to achieve that type of control. It also has this pads antenna design, which means that it has a very directional emission. So it has a single lobe that's normal to the surface here. And um, this is what we measure experimentally in red compared to theory in black. And we can actually collect about 84% of the emission into the first objective lens, which is much higher when we just have emitters and glass, where most of it is actually going into the substrate. And then um, most important in order to actually address this challenge I mentioned with single nanometer fabrication control is that we have this vertical gap structure, which allows us to utilize well known bottom-up uh, chemistry fabrication techniques that allows us to have a control of this gap size in a single nanometer. And we can actually do even better than a nanometer uh, if we want to, but we don't need that in this case, but you could use carbon chains or DNA assembly that allows you control on 0.3 nanometer scale. So the way that we are fabricating these structures is just we start uh, with evaporated silver gold, then we put down this spacer layer, which we often create using a process that's called layer by layer deposition. So all that is is alternating layers of uh, negatively uncharged uh, polymers. And each of these polymers go down a single monolayer and they're charged. So once one monolayer is down, no more of these uh, molecules wants to attach and we just rinse it off. And then we can dip it in uh, the um, other uh, the negatively or positively charged solution. So it's just a dip coating process. And we can that way just build up uh, our structure with these alternating layers and get exactly the thickness we want. And we can do this over wafer scale areas large, so we can do this over conformal surfaces. Um, and then we can immerse the solution in uh, dye molecules, for example, Si5 dyes, or we can spin co quantum dots to put down 2D materials. Uh, so on, and then finally we can put down our um, slightly charged uh, uh, silver nanocubes that are electrostatically adhering to the surface, and then we have our final structure that way. And to fabricate these, we actually do that in a lab, but we follow just the standard process that's published in the literature, so we follow just this reference here. So the first thing we were interested in understanding was uh, how is the emitted fluorescence uh, modified? So um, the first challenge 
in, in doing this is we want to look at individual particles because there's a little bit of um, um, change in the size between the individual ones. So, and they're much smaller than the diffraction limit, so the way that we can image that is using that's called, uh, something that's called dark field uh, microscopy. So we come in with white light at a high angle, and if you have a very clean surface that just have uh, these nanocutes on, these will scatter, and the scatter light is what you see here, and this will depend on the plasma and resonance. So this is actually showing the resonance of different nanopaths and antennas. Um, so the different colors is corresponding to different resonances. And then we can see, uh, if you just focus on one of them and, and look in the spectrometer, and the smaller one, we can see the resonance here is out at 540 nanometer. If you look at a larger cube, it's about uh, 630. So it allows us to tune the wavelengths by just changing the size of the cubes this way. And then if we, for each of these cubes, after measuring the plasmon resonance, look at the amount of emitted fluorescence and plot that on the y-axis here, we can see that there's a strong dependence on the plasmon resonance wavelengths, and we see very large fluorescence enhancements when we are close to the excitation and the absorption wavelengths. We actually see enhancements that are greater than 30,000, which is much larger than what was previously observed as the last enhancement, which was around the 1,300 that I showed. So each of these uh, green crosses is corresponding to an individual nanopath antenna. So we measure the 48 isolated ones this way, and we measure the same one by SEM as well, just to have a careful correlation between the size and the shape of these particles. Uh, so we see this, uh, this strong correlation, and then the next question is, so what's the reason for this? So we are enhancing the quantum efficiency sum from about 20% to 45% is what we're estimating. Uh, we are modifying the radiation pattern. So if it's on glass, a lot of it is going in the glass. And uh, here, it's, we are collecting a larger fraction of that light. So that's also um, a factor. But the main factor is that we are more efficiently exciting the structure. So we have an excitation enhancement of a, a few thousand, which is why we are seeing the last enhancements when we overlap uh, the plasmon resonance with this excitation wavelength. So we can see that this could be uh, useful, for example, for more efficient uh, sensors and that, um, that sort of thing. Or if you have materials that are not uh, absorbing light uh, very efficiently, then this could help to enhance that. So get more insight into uh, what's happening. Another measurement we can do is look at the fluorescence lifetime. Uh, so here we use uh, fast single photon detectors that are basically time tagging when these single photons are emitted. Uh, relative to when our pump pulse comes in. So we use um, uh, short um, uh, 150 femtosecond pulses that are exciting our structures. And uh, when we just look at our control sample of the dye molecules and glass, we see a lifetime about two and a half nanoseconds. But when we put them into these nano antenna structures, they have a lifetime of less than 33 picoseconds. So we can see a, a strongly reduced lifetime, which is indicating a strongly enhanced spontaneous emission rate. Uh, we can also do another control, which is to put our dye molecules on the silver film, and here we also see a reduction in the lifetime. This is indicating an important point that we have to make, which is to take the lifetime data together with overall fluorescence enhancement data. So in this case, we do have an enhancement, uh, a decrease in the lifetime, but uh, we also have a reduced overall fluorescence about 20 times. But when we put these resonance cubes on top, we actually see the shortening in the lifetime, as well as enhanced spontaneous, uh, enhanced fluorescence up to about 30,000 times if it's resonant with the excitation wavelengths. So this is two very different regimes, and when we have this resonant nano antennas, we're actually enhancing really the radiative rate here. But uh, we are limited by the detector here, so we actually expect a much faster lifetime. So we were wondering after we did these experiments, what is the real enhancement in the spontaneous emission rate? How good could the situation really be? And to answer that question, we did some new experiments. Um, and as you might know, if you do experiments, it's very hard to change your detector setup, but it's much easier to change uh, the structures that you're studying. So we chose to look at these ruthenium metal complex dyes that has a lifetime of 600 nanoseconds. So that means that we can enhance uh, the spontaneous emission rate a lot, but without hitting this detector limit, which is around 30 picosecond. And in this case, to enhance uh, the spontaneous emission rate, uh, what we found from simulation is that we expect to have the highest enhancement when we overlap the resonance with the emission spectrum, 
when we wanted to enhance the fluorescence, we saw in the previous slides that if we have an overlap with the excitation wavelengths and the absorption spectrum, we would get the largest fluorescence enhancement out. But uh, in this case, we always overlap it with emission because that will enhance the features we want to look at at this time. And what we do is then vary the gap size, and then we adjust the size of the cube accordingly, such that we always exactly overlap our resonance with our emission spectrum of our um, uh, dye molecules. And this is what we see. So this is our control in, in, um, in dark blue here on a glass substrate. So it just looks flat on this time scale. And then when we put it into gaps from 15 nanometers down to 5 nanometers, we can see a strongly enhanced spontaneous emission rate. And we can see it depends a lot. If you just change the gap size by uh, 3 nanometers, we see a big change. And then it's good to sort of keep in mind that 3 nanometers is usually well beyond electron beam lithography resolution, which is uh, 20, 30 nanometers, depending on how good of a machine you have. But to really understand what's going on here, uh, we have to look at what's the distribution of decay rates. We actually see that this is not a single exponential, it's not a bi-exponential decay, but it's a distribution of many different decay rates. So we want to understand what is the origin of these and how can we best uh, model that. We also have to look at the role of crunching or excitations into the middle versus radiative enhancement. And it also turned out to be really important to understand the dipole orientation of these molecules that are coupled because that depends um, of the enhancement you would expect. So there's a lot of details in this that is often overlooked in these types of experiments. So the first thing is that even though I mentioned that we have a high field enhancement under an entire area under a cube, it's not exactly homogeneous. So this is the, our simulations of the expected enhancement in the spontaneous emission rate compared to glass versus different position under a single cube. So we can see we have the highest enhancements near the corners of a cube. Um, but since in this case we are not looking at single molecules, we are basically sampling all these different positions. So we are sampling all these. So therefore, we expect to see a distribution of decay rates. That's really not surprising. Um, the other thing is that we really have to understand the dipole orientation of these molecules. So we tried to put into the simulation initially that they were just all randomly oriented, which gave us a horrible agreement, which is actually a common assumption. So people usually assume they're randomly oriented or ideally oriented. Um, and we realized we really need to understand this better. So to do that, we actually built a separate setup and we varied the incident angle of the light and the uh, collection angle. And by doing a series of these measurements and fitting all these together, we could extract what is the average orientation of our molecules and what is that distribution. Uh, which is what's shown here. And it's uh, typically 75 degrees to normal, uh, which is really not ideally, actually, <laughs> in our structures. Ideally, uh, the cup is best if it's uh, perpendicular. So, um, but we still have a small projection of, this, um, of the dipole moment in that direction. So we still see enhancements, but it really shows that you could do a lot better than what I'm showing here, even though this is already uh, pretty good, I would say. The other thing that was important to understand was the vertical distribution of emitters. So this might seem like details, but it's something when you want to do truly molecular scale nanoengineering, that's, that's critical. So uh, we put down the polymers, then we put down our emitters, but they're actually intercalating slightly into these polymers. And what we could see is that they're intercalating about two nanometers into these polymers. And since the quantum efficiency varies um, significantly with position, so this is the position from the middle, and we can see the quantum efficiency starts to go down significantly. So in our simulations, we are then averaging over a distance of about two nanometers. And when we do all that, it describes the observed behavior very well. We actually have no fitting parameters whatsoever. Uh, the other thing that's important to understand is the, uh, this um, radiative enhancement of how high is our quantum efficiency really. Unfortunately, we don't have ways that we experimentally can measure that of single nanostructures. So what we can do is measure the overall fluorescence enhancement factor, which has contributions from a modification in the collection efficiency, which is derived from the change in the radiation pattern, which we can measure directly. Then it has this uh, modified excitation enhancement. So that's what I was showing, that we are more, excitedly, um, more efficiently exciting the structures. We can simulate this as a function of gap thickness as well. 
And then the quantum yield we can uh, simulate, we can see strong dependence again with the gap thickness. The horizontal line here at 20% is indicating the intrinsic quantum efficiency of our structures and glass. You can see if we get to lesser gap size, we can actually increase this up to about even above 60%, but when we get to very small gap sizes of five nanometers, this really plummets. And then finally, we can compare our simulations and experimental results uh, of the fluorescence enhancement that takes into account these three factors. And we can see we have a good agreement between experiment and simulations, which is shown in red and blue here. So we can extract that. Um, and we actually do indeed have a high quantum efficiency, which is around 50%, if you choose a gap size of, of around eight to 10 nanometers. So then uh, we can go back to the data and really extract um, more precise information now that we have all this background knowledge. So we can look at just the eight nanometer gap size, which is shown in red here, and the black shows simulations. And from the simulations, we can also um, know what is the probability for these different rates to occur for the experiments. We can do a strat exponential in the Laplace transform, and we can also get a distribution of the different decay rates and that's underlying this data, which is what's shown here. And the tail over here is showing the maximum decay rate, uh, which is occurring shortly after the structure um, of molecules has been excited, which is about 0.7 nanoseconds corresponding to an enhancement in the spontaneous emission rate of 860 times. You can look at the most likely decay rate, which is about 10 nanoseconds, and corresponding to an enhancement about 60 times. Um, and then we can do that for all the different gap sizes. So that was the eight nanometer gap size. We actually have an even smaller gap size that's only five nanometers. This is what I'm showing here. And the maximum decay rate in that case is 0.3 nanoseconds, actually corresponding to enhancement of 2,000 times in the spontaneous emission rate. Uh, and then we can summarize all this data together. So this is, uh, as a function of gap size, we can look at the enhancement in the maximum spontaneous emission rate, which is in blue. So that's all the tails here. We can look at the most likely emission rate enhancement. We can see it follows the same trend, but it's much lower, which is due to mainly the non-ideal orientation of our molecules. And then we can look in the enhancement of the radiative rate, which is the enhancement in the maximum spontaneous emission rate times any change in the quantum efficiency. And we can see when it's the last gap size, this is actually even higher than um, the otherwise, but at the smaller gap sizes, it starts to plummet. So we have an enhancement uh, uh, just around a, a thousand times in the radiative rate, and we can get in exactly the direction we wanted uh, to go in um, uh, perpendicular to the structure. So, so this shows you that we can really tailor uh, some of these properties of our semiconductor materials. We can really get whatever spontaneous emission rate. You tell me what you want, then I can design the structure here, right? But it also shows that we really do need the control of just a single nanometer to, to be able to uh, map out and understand these behavior and actually get a desired result out. So that was using uh, dye molecules. You might like um, a more maybe robust semiconductor platform more. Uh, one option here is using colloidal uh, quantum darts. These um, act as single, can act as single photon emitters, They're often referred to as sort of artificial atoms. So it's a zero dimensional structure. Uh, so uh, these are core shells, so these are calcium selenide zinc sulfide quantum darts, they're about uh, six nanometers. Um, they're commercially available in solutions here. You can uh, get a wide wavelength range by just changing the size or chemical uh, composition. So we were interested in if we can use these structures, these materials, integrate them into the nanopass antenna and get the same enhancement in the spontaneous emission rate. And we also refer to that as per cell factors. Uh, so of course, <laughs> put it that way, we can do that. So in this case, we make similar structures. We uh, create them uh, by spin coding these uh, quantum dots on here. And we can look at them in TEM and we can actually uh, see a few of these quantum dots under the cubes as well. And we have estimated about 10 quantum dots coupled to each of these uh, nano antennas and nano cavities. Uh, then the first thing we looked at was then the fluorescence enhancement to make sure that we still have high quantum um, efficiencies. So this is shown three different nano antennas with coupled quantum dots. Um, the count rate, the emission rate um, versus the excitation power. And we also compared that to quantum dots on glass, which is shown in gray, and quantum dots on gold, uh, which is shown in orange. So we can see for the middle, uh, we get uh, losses, so we get less light out, but when we put it into these nano antennas, we get a lot more light out. 
And we can then normalize that uh, per unit area and compare that to glass, which is what I'm showing here. Uh, we see quite a wide uh, distribution of enhancement factors in this case, because in this case, we are really working to enhance the spontaneous emission rate, and the enhancement in the excitation rate is just um, sort of a side effect. So we see enhancements between 200 and 2200 in this case. But what's really exciting is that in this case, we can show that we can indeed get uh, these uh, quantum dots to emit um, uh, light uh, also fast, about uh, 10 or 11 picoseconds. This is corresponding to an enhancement of about 880 fold compared to uh, the same emitters on glass, which is about 10 nanoseconds. Uh, so there's been some excitement in the community to think about if you could start to make also fast light sources where you don't need stimulated emission as in lasers, but you can actually start to drive these structures, um, uh, the spontaneous emission rate very fast. And this is actually uh, not, uh, not the limit here. This is again, um, limited by our instrument response. So we expect uh, um, a real enhancement, a real lifetime of only a, a few hundred uh, femtoseconds. So already in this case, this shows that you could reach uh, devices that could potentially operate around 100 gigahertz. So then you could get into the terahertz regime. So that would allow you to potentially make fast modulators. It would also allow you to just have uh, LEDs that could be much brighter if you actually could do electrical injection and make them into device structures. But it shows that the spontaneous emission rate itself is not the limiting factor here. Uh, I have to be a little careful. So these structures are excited at pretty low powers. So we are not driving them at these high rates at this, uh, at this time. So we're still looking for more robust materials that we can uh, embed. But I think that's, that's a challenge that can, can be overcome. Uh, so it's just sort of new things that you're realizing along the way. Uh, another thing then that we got interested in is to see how can we uh, potentially address a long-standing challenge to make uh, ultra-fast single photon sources, which is very important for quantum information, also for some quantum optics experiments. And there's been done a huge amount of work in the field using both plasmonic structures, but also a variety of dielectric approaches, such as quantum dots in nanowires and quantum dots in photonic crystal cavities. Um, these were, were done at low temperature, but even if you include that, the enhancements that people have been able to observe is around a factor of 10 or so and lifetimes of a few nanoseconds. So this is a really challenging uh, area. Um, I have to say these are all much better single photon sources than colloidal quantum dots, but we can use colloidal quantum dots as a nice uh, test system to, to test out these new, new principles and see if we can indeed um, get fast single photon sources. So the idea is that traditionally single emitters that have long intrinsic lifetimes at about 10 nanoseconds, which are limiting the single photon rate to about 100 megahertz. So we want to use this uh, Purcell enhancement, uh, uh, radiative enhancement in the nanopads and tenors to increase the single photon rate. Um, and that's what's uh, shown here, is the sample we are, we are creating, where we're basically the same as before, but just using a much lower density of single quantum dots, as you can, might be able to see in the red dots here. And what we then have to do is prove that we have a single uh, quantum emitter. And a single quantum emitter has the property that it can only emit um, a single photon at a time because you're excited, so you excite electron hole pairs, and it takes a finite amount of time for them uh, to recombine and emit a photon. So what you can do to uh, test that is just um, a correlation measurement here. You um, detect the time between two uh, emitted photons here through a beam splitter. You have two detectors and click start and stop. And you see if there is never two photons that are detected at the exact same time, which is then indicating that you indeed have a single, um, single quantum emitter. And that's what we did. Uh, first for quantum dots on glass as our control measurements, which is shown in blue here. And it is indeed showing uh, a dip at time zero, which is saying we don't have two emitted photons at the same time. And this is below 0.5. This is the general rule for you can be able to conclude it's indeed a single, um, single emitter. We then repeat the same for quantum dots, for a quantum dot in the nano cavity, and we also see a dip here at time zero. Uh, so that shows that we can indeed couple a single uh, quantum dot to this nano cavity. We also observe another thing, which is that the width of this dip here is much narrower than in the case of a quantum dot in glass. So that's already telling us something about the lifetime because it's telling us how long does it take for these electron holes to recombine, because that's sort of our forbidden window, and we cannot have two 
uh, photons emitted at the same time. And we can see that this um, forbidden window is much shorter for the case of a quantum dot in the nano cavity, which is showing that the lifetime of these is much shorter. In this case, um, due to the way we were binning the results in the experiment, we can only conclude that the lifetime is less than 250 uh, picoseconds. But that's still a, a big uh, reduction. To see the real lifetime, we do the same uh, time result emission uh, uh, measurement as before. And again, we see detector limited results about 13 picoseconds. And I forgot to say before that uh, the way we get it that short is to do a deconvolution deconvolu with the instrument response, which is what is shown in gray here. Uh, so that allows us to get from about 30 picoseconds down to this um, 13 or 10 picosecond. So this is showing uh, more than a 500 times enhancement in the spontaneous emission rate and also points towards uh, 80 gigahertz, actually even 100 gigahertz single foot on source. This is showing statistics of different single foot on sources we measured. We can see some are down to about 10 picoseconds here, depending a little bit on how the fits work. But this is showing that we can indeed get much, much less enhancement in the spontaneous emission rate than people have been able to do the single foot on sources in the past. And you could potentially make uh, efficient devices. But again, you need to look at some emitters that are a little more stable than these colloidal quantum dots that don't do photobleeds over time and stop emitting light, unfortunately. Um, but uh, they're nice, easy systems to work with otherwise and a nice test bed. Um, so, <laughs> so here I've shown you how we could control the absorption and the spontaneous emission rate pretty efficiently. Uh, we can also control nonlinear processes. So in all the results so far, uh, I just um, I mentioned that um, we have uh, can use these enhanced uh, electromagnetic fields to also enhance nonlinear processes, and we did some uh, some test experiments with that too where we looked at uh, third harmonic generation, which means that we're exciting at 1,500 nanometers and looking at the uh, um, generated signal at 500 nanometers. And these structures, we couldn't uh, use the same cubes because we couldn't get uh, resonances all the way out to 1,500 nanometers. So instead, we fabricated using electron beam lithography these stripes. But we still use this layer by layer uh, deposition as uh, vertical gap geometry that allows us to do uh, atomic layer deposition to define the gap, again, with the single nanometer control. So when you look at the structure from the side, uh, you really have a very similar structure. And if you excite this structure uh, with a polarization uh, perpendicular to the stripe, you're exciting uh, this waveguide cavity mode, uh, which you see with the resonance in the blue here. If you excite along these stripes, it's too long to actually define a cavity, and we don't see a resonance, which is what's in red here. And then we can uh, study structures where we vary the gap size between 2 and 11 nanometers of an uh, aluminum oxide uh, uh, gap material here. Uh, and what we see is, is last enhancement in the third harmonic generation signal as a function of gap size. So we go from about 11 nanometers to about 3 nanometers. And our experiments and data is shown in blue here. So we actually see almost five orders of magnitude enhancement in this uh, third harmonic generated signal. And this actually is compared to gold, which is much more efficient uh, nonlinear material than our aluminum oxide. So this is a very conservative normalization. Uh, but it shows um, that we can really start to, to think about using nonlinear processes a lot more because they can be a whole lot more efficient. And what <laughs> the other data is showing here is that we were trying to figure out if this signal is from the uh, space of material, is it from the gold, is it from a combination of the two? So even though it's a pretty simple structure, there's still a lot of questions that we had to understand. And we did some simulations. If we just look at the metal alone, that's shown in green, we can see it doesn't have a good agreement in the trend, the gap size compared to the blue. Then we took into account the metal and the space of it, which is shown in orals, and still not such a good agreement. Then we show the simulation of the space of material alone, which is shown in red, which is giving us the best agreement. So that's leading us to believe that most of the enhancement that we're seeing is indeed arising due to the space of material, which is aluminum oxide in this case. Uh, so it shows that we can make materials that are actually very 
inefficient and in our <laughs> materials to begin with, very efficient, and you could potentially uh, look at materials that are good to begin with, and you can start uh, using very low power uh, to, to generate these signals. And we can also go to much smaller gaps here. We meant to actually try to go to uh, only a nanometer, so you, there's a huge enhancement expected at these small distances. And our samples just turned out to be uh, slightly larger gap sizes than we designed. But there's a lot of room uh, for improvement here, and I think it's a really exciting area. So in the work I've shown so far, we are actually only taking advantage of one resonance of our nanocavity structure. But of course, we have higher order modes as well. So if you just take uh, one more mode into account, the second order mode here, in addition to the fundamental mode, there's a lot more things that we can play with and, and do. Uh, so this has a fundamental mode at about 660 nanometer and a second order mode at 420 nanometers. And why would you want to do that? So for, for a number of reasons, for example, to look at monolayer transition metal dicarginides, which we also refer to as 2D semiconductor materials. These are, you can exfoliate them the same way as graphene, but they have a direct band gap. There's a lot of excitement in the community to be able to basically make new semiconductor devices that's atomically thin but they do have a lot of associated challenges with them. Uh, they traditionally have a pretty weak absorption around 3% because they're so thin and they have a low quantum yield around 1%. So we were interested to see if we can use the nanocavity to simultaneously enhance the absorption by overlapping one resonance with the absorption spectrum and the quantum yield uh, or quantum efficiency by uh, overlapping the fundamental resonance with the uh, emission. And we can see that um, these structures, they overlap uh, naturally pretty well in these uh, materials. So we can fabricate these structures. So we use CVD grown uh, materials on top of uh, hafnium oxide uh, spacer layer that's grown by atomic layer deposition. We can characterize the structure in dark field uh, imaging here, scattering, where we see uh, the blue outlines here is showing the outlines of the uh, uh, 2D materials, so it's showing sort of wrinkles in, in it that happens during transfer uh, from its, uh, the, the substrates it's grown upon. And the bright dots here is showing single nanocubes. You can also look in the, the fluorescence, so this is uh, zoomed in on one of these, and we can see we get very bright fluorescence just under a cube here, uh, and it just looks dark uh, around it, even though we have the MOS2 uh, material everywhere. And we can characterize that as well, so we can just look at the PL as opposed to the PL of the MOS2 on its native substrate, the silicon dioxide here. So we can see a large enhancements again. We also observe a small shift uh, in the peak position of the emission. We can see uh, the uh, blue is the uh, emission spectrum uh, on its uh, control substrate, and red is in the cavity, and we can see uh, when we put it in the cavity, it sort of pushed uh, uh, to the red to overlap better with the nanocavity scattering spectrum. And we think this is because we are changing the quantum efficiency um, of the material, sort of screwing it towards that, um, that cavity resonance. Uh, we can also explore uh, this behavior more by varying the excitation wavelengths and look at the average fluorescence enhancement factor. And uh, what we see here is, is two peaks. So the first peak is overlapping to the first resonance, and the second peak here is starting to overlap with the second resonance. And this is cut off by a filter here, so we couldn't go any further. Uh, but it's showing uh, up to about 2,000-fold enhancement in the photoluminescence in this case. Uh, this is much lower than what we saw using dye molecules. And the main reason is that, as I told you before, using um, the dipole orientation of our emitters matters a lot. And in these structures, this is mainly in plane and our structure is basically cobbling best to the outer plane field. So this is not optimized structure, but even in this non-ideal structure, we can see uh, significant enhancements. But it also just points to, as I think, the bigger picture, that we can start to play with these multiple resonances uh, to control nonlinear generation, entangled photons, or any other multivalence uh, optical processes that I think is pretty exciting. It gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, so. Everything I've shown you so far has just been on single nanoparticles, and we can learn a lot from that. But uh, often it's challenging to go from single na nanoparticles uh, to larger scales. But because we're using colloidal synthesis and all these self-assembly techniques, that's actually very straightforward in our systems. So um, looking at these large-scale perfect absorbers, 
So we just have the same structure here, but don't put in any emitters uh, and put them on um, our uh, substrate here at a, a relatively high density. It actually allows us to um, control the effects of electromagnetic response of these uh, um, surfaces, and that allows us to impedance match this to free space. So if you have the exact right density, we can actually get uh, perfect absorption at specific wavelengths. Uh, this is uh, what we were illustrating here. If you come in with a bunch of different wavelengths, most of them just reflect back uh, as they would at any surface. But if you come in with a particular wavelength, for example, red here, it's completely absorbed and nothing is reflected. And that's what we're also showing here. So we can see we get a, um, a, a absorption about 99.6 uh, and 99.7 percent, actually. And we can see this is over a uh, truly large area, so we can um, put these nanocubes on an area that's about a centimeter, and then we can um, defocus our tunable laser that's a little bit larger and look at the reflection of the sample on a white screen. And this is what we see. We see um, no effect when we go from blue and green and yellow and orange, and then once we hit the resonance, it just goes completely black in the area that has the nanocubes. Um, and we can see, uh, we still see reflection outside, which is the areas that don't have any nanocubes, and then we go past the resonance, uh, we see um, this unreflected reflection again. So we can really do spectrally selective uh, perfect absorption in this case, and we can also do that uh, over um, conformal surfaces. So uh, we sacrificed the lens here from the lab and coated this with gold and polymers and then put the nanocubes on top, this SEM that's actually taken from the side here, and we can measure and see the same perfect reflection, uh, or perfect absorption. We see uh, this has a greenish tint because all the red is absorbed, but we can see the rest is unaffected. So this is the Duke Chapel we were <laughs> trying to image here. Um, and we can um, tune the wavelengths by changing the size, as I mentioned. So we tried to uh, modify the synthesis to get lots of cubes to move this from the more visible wavelengths into the uh, silicon wavelengths. And this is actually SEMs, and we can see when we have the synthesis go longer, it starts to move away from being cubes to being these cuba octahedrons that look pretty, but it has not turned out to not exactly be what we wanted. <laughs> so we could measure the reflection here for the different size cube. So this is 75 nanometers. And by changing the gap size from one to five nanometers, we can actually tune the resonance about five, uh, 200 nanometers. And we can see as we pick larger cubes, we redshift these uh, range. And we can um, summarize that here. So this is showing the fundamental resonance uh, on the y-axis, a function of the particle size. So this is just the size across here. And we can see once uh, we get to a size that's above um, 130, 140 nanometers, once they start to not be cubic anymore, the resonance starts to go down. And the reason for that is simply that the um, sides the areas of these facets become smaller, which is the ones that are actually defining the cavity um, between that and the underlying metal film. Uh, so therefore, the resonance um, goes to uh, shorter wavelengths. So, but even from this, we can see that the resonance is tunable from the visible before we show it down from about 500 nanometers uh, up to the near infrared. I think we can go up to 1,420 nanometers is, is the longest we can go. Uh, but you could imagine you might be able to go further. We just have to modify uh, the synthesis process as well. It also gives us very good control of um, the uh, absorption by just controlling the fill fraction. So this is showing how long we do incubation of these metal uh, silver nanocubes on our surface from about one minute to 60 minutes. And we can see it's very uniform. So this is a centimeter area. We can do SEMs, and we can see how we can modify the fill fraction from about 5% to about 19%. And um, this is showing the maximum absorption for different fill fractions. So we can see uh, we can control the fill fraction or the absorption by just controlling the mean uh, spacing between the nanocubes. And once you get to a fill fraction about 19%, you get perfect absorption. It also shows good performance at oblique incidence angle. So if you take the case with the highest um, fill fraction, which is the light blue here, we see that it's pretty flat here out to uh, 50 or 60 degree incident angles. And you can actually do this as well, uh, start to play with, with different resonances at the same time. So you can make pixel arrays with, with different wavelengths here. 
so just using cubes of different sizes, of different gap thicknesses. And this can be patterned using photolithography, so there's still no electron beam lithography required here. So you could imagine making uh, more efficient photodetectors and that sort of thing. You can also do uh, image reconstruction. So here in this case, where we are uh, creating an image of a, of a bird, we're varying the length of just three different sizes of cubes here. So we're varying the intensity of each of these colors by varying the length um, of uh, the area that's filled by the cubes. So that's showing you some of the, the flexibility that these uh, 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 colloidal synthesis can give you. I think I'm almost running out of time. So just very briefly, I will show you some that does some work that doesn't involve cube that gives us a wavelength tunable uh, plasma and lasers. Uh, so what we looked at here in collaboration with Terry Oda, Matt North Western was um, uh, just a disc array on a glass film. So very simple structure. Then we surround it with a liquid um, uh, dye, so we mix IR140 in, in liquid here that's uh, floating around. And then uh, this structure actually supports what's called a, a lattice plasma mode, so it actually uh, can have a lasing at a particular frequency that depends on the distance between these, these disk structures. But what's, and we can characterize this uh, to see, verify that we have lasing here. We're also doing some coherence measurements at the time. Uh, but what's really fun is that uh, this structure is sensitive to the index of refraction, and by using the same dye but embedding it in liquids with different index of refraction, we can actually tune the wavelengths over 55 nanometers. Because I think that's a really fun uh, area once you start to look at nanomaterials to start to get added functionalities or reconfigurable properties, and this is a way to get to that. And by integrating this with a microfluidics device, it actually enables you to have real-time tunability by just flowing in um, these uh, different index of refraction liquids, and then you can sh uh, shift your wavelengths back and forth to so do more uh, adiabatic tuning here, and we can see it's very uh, reprodu reproducible, repeatable, uh, and we can do it on the order of a few seconds. So just to uh, finish up, I showed you that we can create a large fluorescence enhancement exceeding 30,000. We can increase the spontaneous emission rate a couple thousand. We expect if we can actually orient the dipoles probably of our molecules or emitters, we should be able to get up to about 10,000 in these structures. I showed you a large control of cell factors, uh, the spontaneous emission rate of quantum dots. We even showed ultra fast and efficient single photon sources. Uh, I showed you how we can use multiple resonances of these plasmonic structures uh, to control properties of monolayer MOS2. I briefly showed you that we can also enhance nonlinear processes. And we can do this over uh, large areas and then this uh, real-time tunable lasing as well. And I think uh, looking forward, it's exciting to start to think about uh, nanomaterials uh, by design, where we can really uh, think of about what properties would we like and then start to, to design uh, structures that would be able to achieve that. And also, now that we can start thinking about having the materials that are deriving the properties not from the intrinsic materials, but from the surroundings. If we can modify these surroundings in real time, we can get uh, reconfigurable properties and added functionalities. And I think it's also in very interesting to start to think about uh, how we can use this for on-chip uh, quantum networks. So to, before I finish, I also want to make sure to acknowledge my group at Duke that did all this work, okay? Uh, and collaborators, David Smith, Jing Kong at MIT, Terry Oda, Matt North Western, and Sang Hong Oh in Minnesota. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, do we have any questions? Anant. I have two questions. Uh, so first one is slightly non-technical, and the non-technical question is a lot of exciting work on nanomaterials and optical characterization, but looking at the outlook over there, is your group also planning to get into building of devices using them, or is it mainly involved in, in the optical characterization uh, aspect of things? Uh, so the question was if uh, my group is also interested in actually uh, creating devices based on this uh, or not. So I, I come from a quantum optics background, uh, quantum information, so I'm very excited both on the fundamental things. I'm also starting to get very excited about the, the potential more proof of concept devices. So we're starting to think about how can we integrate 
uh, the enhanced spontaneous emission with electrical injection. We're actively working on that to actually show if we can make LEDs out of this. We're also actively working, have DOD collaborators, how can we integrate these perfect absorbers with already uh, photodetectors, uh, maybe looking at longer wavelengths in ranges that, that has interest than where uh, from, from DOD where they don't have as, as, as cheap or efficient uh, structures. So, so both working a little bit on the proof of concept. As I'm not going to be able to give you full devices, but, but, but more proof of concept in that direction. I'm also working on more, more basic quantum optics. How can we look at super radiance? How can we look at few emitters? That it's a very interesting sort of cavity QED platform as well, um, and entangled photons, that sort of thing. So, yeah. You also spoke about a spontaneous emission um, a radiative lifetime of about 0.1 picoseconds for your quantum dot. Um, so how did you come up with that estimate? Um, so uh, the question was that I spoke about a spontaneous emission of the quantum dots of 0.1 picoseconds. So, um, and how I came up with, with that number. So what we see now is about 10 picoseconds. Um, but um, it's basically the enhancements that we would expect. So we would expect enhancements uh, based on the dye measurements that we did with the fluorescing dyes. We see about enhancement between 2,000 and we expect about 10,000 if we can control the dye polarization. So based on those enhancements uh, that we expect to translate from dye molecules to quantum dots, we would expect lifetimes that short. Yeah. Yeah. You showed a couple of approaches for uh, wavelength tuning at uh, design or fabrication time. Um, and then also kind of a, a fluidic way of controlling uh, tuning on situ. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any way to do it with electric or magnetic fields to make something that could be like super self-contained, small in size for tunable detectors or something like that? Yeah, so the question was if we can do some electrical magnetic in situ uh, dynamic control of the wavelength tuning. Uh, I absolutely think we can do that. I already have some preliminary results on that. It's just not quite ready to share that. Um, it's, it turns out to often be a little more challenging that, than you would expect. We, we are exploring a number of different approaches. Uh, so uh, the thing is that these nanocube structures are very sensitive to the properties in the, in the gap. If you saw how we could almost tune the gap, the resonance by 200 nanometer by changing the gap by from one to three to five nanometers. You could imagine any piezoelectric material uh, you could put in there that could, could act actively change the gap size. You could change the index of refraction. You can do um, carrier density modification and ITO. Um, so, so there's a lot of prop, uh, possibilities. You could look at phase change materials. Um, so we are, we're exploring all those options, actually. So we're exploring like five different ways of, of actually tuning that. I'm, I'm sure some of it will. Uh, uh, it should work, I hope. Uh, so I think it, it could be really exciting that you could start adding more functionalities in that way. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? Maybe I'll ask one question. Um, so it's really uh, neat how you can control the cavity resonance uh, with the size of the particle and, and the careful nanometer control of the gap. What are the prospects for single emitter applications for controlling the alignment of the cavity to the actual spatial and dipole uh, alignment of the quantum emitter? Yeah, uh, so the, the question was, how can we actually align a single emitter under these cubes? Because uh, that would be required for, for quantum optics or quantum information schemes. Um, so far, these experiments were done with random uh, uh, position of quantum dots and cubes. And you would think that would actually be pretty impossible. It's not quite as impossible as it sounds, because we're looking at large areas. We're exciting this large area. And the enhancements are so large that we can actually see some of these cubes that are super bright. And that is indicating that we have a single emitter. But again, that's not good enough if we want to make some integrated network. So there's a lot of approaches, actually, at least a few. You can do a DNA assembly, so you can functionalize uh, particular areas on your sample. And you can um, uh, have cubes, or you can attach quantum dots to that, and cubes that are attaching to, to those structures. You can attach quantum dots directly to the cubes. Um, uh, I'm talking to Chad Merkin at Northwestern. They have a lot of self-assembly techniques that you can do that. Um, I think you can even you can even just do EBL positioning of, of some quantum dots and then put the, the cubes on top. But I think the more chemical self-assembly approaches is, is the most promising. But it's challenging. But there's a lot of lot of interesting approaches there. And I think there's so much that we can do by by really collaborating with, with people from other fields. That it's, it's pretty fun. 
Okay, if that's all our questions, let's thank Mike in one more time.